Hi there and welcome to week three, part one, where we are finally going to take a little look at code. We're going to try to get an overview of what code is and how it works on a more practical level and try to understand how the instructions that we write tur turns into action from the computer. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, bits and the basic units of the computer. We're going to talk a little bit about programming languages, what they are, uh, what differentiates them, what they look like, what they're built of. We're going to talk a little bit about how the computer takes our code and processes it so that it can perform instructions. We're also going to talk a little bit about the evolution of code. So how has it evolved and changed uh, through a process called abstraction. So we're going to delve into what abstraction means. And we're also going to go through a little bit about the coding process and how it works when you sit down to code and what you practically do when you sit down and write in an IDE. What you should think about, how you should approach that process. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, jump into an overview of code. So let's really think about what code is. Yes, code is instructions, but more principally, code is a way to communicate with the computer. Code is taking an idea of what you want the computer to do and putting it into words and expressions that the computer can understand. So we need to be able to take our complicated ideas and break them down into these binary statements, um, meaning yes or no, with no ambiguity whatsoever in there. And these binary instructions get translated by, by the computer um, into on and off uh, charges in the hardware of the computer itself. So everything we do uh, when we use a computer, whether we're coding or wh whether we're just using it, it gets translated down the line into um, zeros and ones. And the hardware then uh, translates these zeros and ones and converts them into terms turning uh, on and off uh, specific uh, electric electrical pathways uh, in the computer. And that's how it performs uh, the instructions that we give it, right? So a one might mean yes or on when we're coding. Uh, it might mean, uh, as it usually does, uh, true. So that gets translated and in the computer's hardware a, an electrical current gets turned on. Similarly then um, a zero can mean uh, or a no or false can mean zero and that turns off another um, electrical pathway and that is how from from using the computer it gets translated into um, binary and that binary corresponds directly to all of the uh, electrical pathways in your computer and by turning on and switching uh, off these pathways the computer changes its states and state and performs the instructions that we give it as users and as programmers so this might sound incredulous even that we can do all of this with just ones and zeros but interestingly, interestingly, think about Morse code. So Morse code is based on really only two different signals. You have a, a long beep and a short beep. Um, and through those two, long and short beep, you can say everything that you can say um, in our alphabet. So every single word in the English language, every single sentence can be translated into Morse code using just that short and long beep and in the same way ones and zeros can encode in the same way s enormous amounts of information data and, and instructions um, by using these two uh, binary opposites on and off one and zero uh, 
uh, by putting them together into um, by putting them together and 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 having them as a unit we can say that this is not correct but one zero 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 one zero one means the, the letter H and so by using these ones and zeros we can encode anything we want really and that is how uh, computers work so our job as uh, jobs uh, or our job as programmers is then to take what we want the computer to do um, put it in a, a way so that the computer can perform the yes or no uh, sort of task uh, and change its hardware to do what we ask it to do so we need to learn to think like a computer so in theory, we could just do that, write one zero one 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 zero one one one, and have that to be our instruction. Uh, but that's not very feasible, not very realistic, and it's it would take a lot of time and effort to learn that, and it's just not it's not applicable and effective. So what we've done is we we use programming languages to um, keep to certain formats, and then the computer can translate what we say within those formats two ones and zeros down along the line that then gets translated to electrical signals. And that's why we have these programming languages because there's a way to convert what we want, what we say in the programming language to these ones and zeros that then move on and get converted to electrical signals. So just be aware here that the computer doesn't understand programming languages. They're made for us developers to read and understand and manipulate and work together on. Um, it always needs to translate the, those um, commands that we write using um, grammar and uh, words, or as we call it in the programming world, syntax, um, that we can understand, that we can read. Uh, and the computer just takes that and converts it into a format it can understand. So if everything we, gets uh, we do gets translated into ones and zeros, then those you can think of as the, um, the most basic units, the, the smallest parts, the atoms uh, of a computer. So those are called bits. So one single bit, one bit, represents either a one or a zero. And that is the smallest part of the computer. And all of those bits uh, working together um, is what makes a computer run and do what it's supposed to do. Now, usually it comes in a set of eight, and that is called a byte. And then you put more and more of those together, and eventually you get to um, kilobyte, uh, megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, etc., etc., etc. Um, and that is how um, storage is also me measured uh, on a computer. So if you have a uh, image on your computer that is 1.1 uh, megabyte, doesn't seem that big really, but that is then 8.8 uh, million bits that all are encoded to be either a one or a zero uh, that then gets um, represented as the image to you when you look at it. So say you write a code or write code to do something um, that gets uh, translated into the ones and zeros and the computer's hardware receives these bits, these ones and zeros as instructions. So it takes those and based off of those, it, uh, these little transistors, these li little electronic gateway switches in your computer gets turned on uh, or off depending on your instructions and that's how the hardware changes and performs your instructions. So one plus one might um, get translated to one 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 zero one 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 zero zero one 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 and that tells the computer turn this one off, turn this one on, turn this one off, etc 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 and that's how the computer performs your calculation. Um, so everything we write uh, even though we understand it, gets translated and processed and changed into ones and zeros that then the computer uses to know which electrical um, currents to block or to allow to pass through. So since writing 11011 etc. is really difficult to do, uh, we invented programming languages. 
Um, and these are structured way of expressing ourselves that they are then uh, tools to help us uh, redo that into the ones and zeros. That's why it's so strict and why we need to use certain keywords and certain uh, uh, ways of putting words one after the other because the computer needs to have that in the correct order and it needs to have these keywords to know how to, how to um, translate it into the ones and zeros. So programming languages have their own way of speaking, their own grammar and verbs and words and, and syntax, but it, it is still a language in a way. Um, the same way that I could be speaking English to you or Swedish to you, uh, but express the exact same idea, uh, programming languages take uh, your ideas and just express them in different ways to the computer. And then you take um, programming languages that are suited for specific purposes, so they, they're still, still saying the same thing, they're still um, speaking to the computer in a way it understands, it's just using maybe um, a different sequence of words or different keywords but how to speak um, is the same, much as if you would learn a completely new language, like say French, um, it's, it's still uh, containing verbs, it's still expressing um, um, opinions, emotions, etc. It's still communication in the same format, just a different way of um, structuring it or, or um, a, different for, a different way of doing it, but it, it is still a language. Um, I could speak any language and express the same idea um, and it would be still the same idea. So this might sound really intimidating, learning how to speak to a computer and learning a new way of expressing yourself. But let's think about this for a second. So right now, uh, according to uh, what I've been able to find, we have about 170,000 words in the English language and about 20 to 30,000 words used in everyday expression. That's a lot of words. And a standard programming language has about up to 100. So while it is a different way of thinking and while it can feel very intimidating to start learning this way of expressing yourself, you need, you, I want you to remember that while it's scary, Computers are so much simpler than human beings and the amount of phrases, words, concepts you need to learn to program are minuscule compared to human communication in a language. Um, you might need to learn a few keywords and how to put uh, words in a specific order, um, but compared to human uh, language and co human communication, it is so much simpler and it is so much more accessible and, and so, so much less that you need to take in to be able to start expressing yourself in that way. Um, so <coughs> if you learn these, these key, key phrases, the most challenging part is learning how to use them to express your ideas. But the languages themselves, um, aren't that challenging or intimidating uh, to learn once you actually start to get some more experience and get some, some, some breadth into the whole thing. If you um, would in one language use one keyword and in another, another keyword, just the fact that you know that both of these languages have a keyword for that, meaning for example, say that you want to specify that something is a number just the fact that you know that you can do that in this language and in this language that is kind of all you need to know because a specific keyword if there's a hundred of them you can find that out the the challenge in programming isn't remembering and memorizing um, all of these things it's understanding how to express yourself how they're structured and then okay i've written this code in this language and I know it, I know that this is a feature of programming languages. That means that in this language, there should be an equivalent. Um, so learning the concepts and knowing that uh, there's a very limited amount of vocabulary that you need to learn, 
but that you need to use it. Uh, that is what programming is more about. And when we communicate as human beings, we're a lot smarter than a computer. Um, if I uh, am vague and give you context, you might understand what I mean, uh, because you can conclude based off of uh, what I say in your experiences. And we do this all the time uh, in our everyday language, and we pick up on associations and nuances. And computers are stupid. They don't have this at all. Um, we, that is why we can't be ambiguous or have gray zones, because they're too dumb. Um, we need to be clear, concise, and either yes or no. Uh, think of when you're stressed and, and you're asking a question, you just want a yes and no answer. That, that is how a computer co communicates. Um, and by eliminating all of these gray zones, these, this ambiguity, all of that, it even further limits how we speak to them and the amount of, um, the amount of different expressions and way of, uh, ways of talking to a computer that you need to learn. Um, so focuses, focus is on learning how to translate this gray area, this ambiguity, into yes and no statements. So let's go through uh, some programming languages really briefly so you have like an overview of the main ones that it, that's out there. So for, first we have Python, which is a uh, r very uh, modern and um, uh, beginner-friendly uh, programming language that is very used in um, de uh, data science. So for um, taking a vast amount of information and finding patterns in that information. Um, if, uh, and that's, that's the level of, of overview we're gonna, we're gonna have in this video. We have uh, JavaScript, which is used for uh, code that runs in your browser. So websites uh, is JavaScript and everything that you see uh, in the browser is JavaScript. And lately, um, well lately, they also developed a way to use JavaScript for servers, which um, hasn't always been uh, possible, but they made it so that you can use JavaScript both um, for the code that you get in your browser and for uh, servers that um, send you the code. We have um, uh, C Sharp, which is a language um, developed from uh, Microsoft. Um, is it? I think so. Don't quote me on that. It's not important who developed it, but it is a, a programming language that um, is used in uh, both um, servers. So the same as JavaScript, you can have it servers to send information to your browser. You can use it uh, for that. Uh, people use it for gaming and for um, uh, software development in general. It's a very popular language. It's um, not as beginner friendly, I would say, as JavaScript and Python, uh, but it is uh, among the uh, more pop, uh, beginner friendly languages out there. We have this language called Java, which is a very general purpose language. It's really independent of what you want to do with it. Uh, and, and broad in that sense. Um, but it is very popular for, for a very uh, large scale enterprise, so big corporations that want to do, uh, want to have applications that are um, big and complicated. Um, we also, you, people also use it a lot for um, Android app uh, development. So that is usually what you code in if you make uh, apps for Android. Uh, C++ is a um, not so beginner friendly uh, uh, programming language that is very often used in something called embedded systems. So if you say have a um, smart thermostat, that's my favorite uh, example, that has a sensor and a little microchip, a little mini computer that sends information over the over Wi-Fi somewhere. Uh, chances are that uh, that little chip is going to be using C++. The use the reason that you can have it on such small um, computers or microchips, and the reason why it's not so beginner friendly, is that it um, 
requires you to make more decisions, more direct decisions about um, the system. So for example, um, usually if you uh, program and you um, save something to memory and then you want to delete that from memory, you don't want it anymore, um, the computer does that automatically. You don't have to think about it. But when you use C++, you need to think about it and specify for the computer to uh, remove that and free up that memory. So it gives you more control, but it also means that you need to think about more things and control more things. And in order to control how that works, you need to know how that works. And that's why it's not so beginner friendly. It's still a very powerful language. It's just um, not so easy to have that as your first language to learn because you because you need to know so much background in order to have that control and that flow. Um, knowing those things, you can fine tune and optimize and say, well, I want to save this memory space, so I'm going to delete that. But then you need to know that you can delete that without destroying the system. Um, it also is used in some gaming um, uh, game uh, programming and in certain engines um, you use C++ as well. And then lastly we have on our list, there's many many more, but lastly on our list we have Swift which is the language that people use uh, to develop um, uh, Mac OS uh, applications. So uh, apps for the iPhone or uh, applications that go on a Mac computer, you develop that in Swift. So that is a little overview of what's out there. Um, and probably in this education, if you're working with web, uh, chances are you're going to learn JavaScript. Um, and you might come in contact with other programming languages. And after a while, you'll, you'll start to see similarity, similarities between them. And if you want to try out another one, just to get your toes wet with something else, an easy transition from JavaScript is Python because it's so beginner friendly. So if languages uh, have different ways of saying the same thing, how might that look? Um, because code is very strange to just read out loud and people won't understand it. I'm just going to give one single example. Um, so when you're coding, sometimes you have this output, a little window where you can ask the computer um, to give you back text. Um, you use this a lot to um, see if there's any mistakes in your code or see what happens if you do this. Um, uh, and in JavaScript, that code is console.log and then there's a parenthesis, and then you write what you want the computer to give back to you. So if I write console.log uh, parenthesis hello, when I run that program, I'm going to get the word hello in a little black uh, box, and I'm going to get that as a text, uh, as a message uh, from the program. So that's console.log. Um, and in Python, you do the exact same thing, it's just that instead of console.log, you write print. So you write print, you have a parenthesis, and you write hello. And you can do this in all languages. And similarly, you'll have the same uh, functionality in all languages, but they'll use uh, different keywords. And that is then the keyword. In Python, it's print, and in JavaScript, it's console.log. So just by learning uh, one of them, you can then, if you want to transition or try out another language, you know that this concept exists. So you can write, how do I do console log in C sharp? And you'll get an answer that gets your functionality, but just hands you the keywords on how to do it. So earlier we spoke a bit about how computers don't understand these programming languages and they need to be translated into uh, ones and zeros for them to be able to perform the instructions. So there's really two main ways this happens. Um, you have uh, compiled languages, and these languages are, um, you code, you tell the computer to bundle that code, and then that, then that gets turned into um, machine code. So you need to basically uh, 
press a button and wait and you get like this little output and that is the machine code then that the computer can run. Uh, for example, you can get a .exe uh, that you can double click and then it runs, runs that program. So the compiled languages, they, they take the entire bunch of code and translate it, translates it into machine code all at once uh, into the ones and zeros. And then we have the other kind. So the other one is interpreted code. So this one doesn't take a whole chunk. This translates the code line by line as it runs. So for example, if you would uh, take this, these concepts and put it into uh, a metaphor, then um, compiled languages or programming languages that need to compile the code to turn it into the machine code is like taking a book and translating the whole book and presenting the book. Whereas uh, an interpreted language is um, an interpreter, maybe that's where the name came from, that translates what somebody is saying as they're saying it um, sentence by sentence or piece of sentence by piece of sentence. So it, it, it translates uh, the code into machine code on the fly, line by line, as it's running it. This is the type of code that is in your browser. So JavaScript is a interpreted language, whereas, um, for example, I believe Java is a um, compiled language. So they do the same things. It, it translates it into one, uh, ones and zeros into machine code, but one needs to do the whole block at once and one does it line by line as it's running it. So scratch that, I just looked it up and Java is both an interpreted and a compiled language because you can download tools to do both. Um, but C++ is a uh, compiled language where you press a button and wait for the whole book to be interpreted before you can run that program. Uh, when describing how we went from ones and zeros to uh, print hello, uh, we talk about the code evolution or, or abstraction. So what is abstraction? Um, basically, it's hiding complicated stuff into more uh, in more understandable stuff. So if you imagine that print hello is really 110111, we're hiding those zeros and ones into in print, which you and I can read and understand what it does. So the higher abstraction, the more easy it is, it is for us to understand intuitively, the more human-like it is. That means that it's further away from the ones and zeros, the hardware and um, the machine code that the hardware needs to uh, do what it's supposed to do. So when talking about abstraction, high abstraction means um, further away from ones and zeros, and low abstraction is closer to the ones and zeros. So if you ever hear the, the term low level language or lower level language, that means that it's closer to binary, um, to machine code, and high level language means that it's closer to human language. So how we've done this is that if we start off with 110111, then it evolved into um, maybe a complicated phrase. Let this, 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 this. It's not important. But then we simplified that functionality um, and made it even easier to understand. And then maybe we added um, some type of functionality under there to make sure that um, the things we would need to do manually, such as maybe clean up memory, gets included into that key phrase, into that word. So we have this pyramid structure of up here, we have something human understandable, high abstraction, easy to understand, easy to use. And the further down into the pyramid we go, the closer we get to the zeros and ones. And maybe there's some functionality baked in that you and I have no idea about as programmers. And we don't need to really. Um, you don't need to understand how um, an oven works behind the scenes to be able to flip a switch and turn it on. Um, because of 
if you know what it does and what's the purpose of it, that is usually enough. And no one programmer is going to ever have the time to learn everything. So if you are curious and you just want to know everything, you do need to get that out of your mind. It's enough to know what it does um, and that it exists and that there might be stuff hidden in your keyword that um, you don't know might be there. It's still going to do the job though. So the word print, hello, for example, if you go into a low level language closer to uh, ones and zeros, say assembly, it could be like several lines of code to just do that. And that makes one program much, much longer and harder to read um, and to work with. And that is why abstraction um, is such a great thing. Not only does it simplify and help beginners learn, uh, learn and get into coding, and it makes it more intuitive and easier for us to just jump in and get the hang of things. It also simplifies the process and, and um, saves time because we don't need to write so much code to um, get our point across to the computer. Um, if print hello is 10 lines of code, uh, imagine what complicated um, applications, how long those uh, programs could be if we didn't use abstraction. In keeping with this um, uh, term of abstraction and adding functionality under the hood of things, we use these uh, things called, or we have those thing, these things called libraries and functions. So say you wanted to do something simple like add two and two together. Um, using a high level language, it's very possible that um, there are libraries and tools that um, make it possible for you to just write two plus two. And without these languages, you would need to write a lot more code and maybe specify first that it's a number, then specify that it's an arithmetic, um, uh, arithmetic um, um, equation. Arith that you want to do arithmetics, then you would need to specify that the next thing is also a number and so on and so forth. You would have to add a lot more uh, detail about uh, what you want to do. And having these libraries and tools that either you download yourself or that are included in the language, um, we don't have to think about those things. And this makes us better coders because those things aren't what we're supposed to do. Our job is to be um, smart in taking ideas and turning it into solutions. We don't always need to know. If you're, if you're a baker, your, your job is to make great cakes. Your job isn't to know exactly um, how, the, um, how the oven heats up. Um, Focusing on how the oven heats up and ignoring how to make great cakes is going to make you a sucky baker. Um, so by adding these um, shortcuts or by hiding these functionalities into keywords, we get more tools uh, to use and we don't have to think about these simple, um, really not really um, important aspects of, uh, computer, of, of computers and how they work. So I'm gonna try to get a bit more technical, I know, even more technical, and try to uh, show you how this could look. So say that we are making a calculator um, and your language doesn't have a way to add numbers together. So we go online and we find this packaged code that's called math. Um, and in math, you have uh, the functionality to add and to subtract. So it, math is the umbrella term for the, uh, the umbrella keyword for this bundle of code. So you type math and then a dot. And then after that, you can specify in this particular uh, mathematical problem, do I want to use addition or subtraction? So 
the umbrella term, the, the, the code snippet of math contains both functionalities. So after the dot, you specify which one you want to use. So if you would, uh, again, write math dot add, then the computer knows what to do and you don't have to manually write out everything. So you have math dot add and a parenthesis, and then you write the numbers you want to add. So you've just used a library that provides the functionality to uh, do math, and you've specified in this library, in, this, these, amount, in these various functionalities that it, it contains, which functionality you want to use. Um, and that is how we uh, use functions and hide code and make our lives simpler. So these are tools for us to use and um, know that they exist and uh, to make us more effective uh, programmers. So when you use binary logic, when you talk to computers, my cat clearly likes her new scratch board. Um, you need to phrase what you say in a way that um, if it's a condition that it results in a yes or a no. So for example, say you want to make an automatic light. This light will turn on when it's dark and it will turn off when it's light. So how you would phrase that, a condition, in order to, uh, in a way that results in a yes or a no, you could say, if, um, if bright or if light, light is a bad word, if bright, turn off light. There's a condition, we're checking if it's uh, bright outside, if it's daytime, and if it is, uh, we turn the light off. So that's a no. And then we can check if dark, turn light on. Another condition that results in a yes or no, on. And that is how we need to learn how to talk to computers. Everything we, we want to express, we need to frame in this way, that it that there is a condition that can result in a yes or a no. You can also do comparison. Um, let's say you are at a bar uh, and you want to order a drink. If you're a bartender, you could express this as a uh, in code. Um, if age is under 18, no beer or no. Um, if age higher than 18, Yes, beer. These are conditions and they result in a yes and no answer, depending on if it fulfills the condition. Um, and that is how we need to uh, learn how to express ourselves, which is difficult when there's ambiguity, but that is the challenge of learning how to code. So we've gotten a very broad, general, big overview of code. So probably it's a mystery what, what it looks like when you're actually gonna sit down and do any coding. So what does it look like? You go to your computer, you turn it on, you start doing it. What do you start doing? So first of all, you code in an IDE, an integrated development environment. Uh, in there, you type your code and you can uh, click run and see uh, what your code does uh, when it's running in the environment where it's supposed to. So the IDE helps you uh, fake the environment that your code's going to work in. Say that you are going to uh, have a website, uh, then you can run the code and the IDE is going to uh, behave uh, like the website is going to behave. So say for example that you uh, code one plus one, when you run it, if you have asked the computer to give you the answer to that, it's going to display a two. Um, so you start off by writing your code and um, running it in the runtime environment that exists on your computer. And it's going to do what you want it to do um, in the environment you want it to be in. Like I said, if you're doing a website, it's going to act like a website. 
So you keep coding, you keep writing in the IDE, you keep pressing run, you keep testing out if your code works the way you think it's going to work. And when you think it's done, uh, and this comes after a lot of testing, uh, then you need to move your code uh, somewhere else. So if you're making a website, right now in your IDE, that, that code is only available to you. So you need to put your code somewhere where you can have a URL, a web address, um, give it out to other people, and when they type it in, they receive your code. So that is a process uh, that is called deployment. Um, you copy paste your code and put it on a server. When somebody asks your server, hey, can I get the information that is on this web address? They receive the code you've written. The browser gets that code and it um, processes it and it's going to behave the same way that it did as when you tested it. Um, and this is, this is the process. You start writing in your IDE, you test it along the way, make sure that everything is working, and then you put it somewhere and make it available for users uh, to enjoy. And so what is a program then? A program is a bunch of instructions put together, a bunch of lines of code together that perform a task. So uh, a program could be a word processor. The task is to process words, to give you somewhere to write, uh, um, um, write what you need to write. Um, so then the program uh, con consists of a bunch of code that they put together, that they bundle, they um, turn it into a .exe and you can put it on your computer, double click it, and that starts the program that runs the code that is there. Um, so essentially the, the difference between just lines of code and a program is that lines of code exist in your IDE and once you turn it off, you can't access it anymore. You need to go into your IDE, run it again, and that runs the code. Whereas a program, if you uh, create a program, you can um, create that, copy it, and send it to a friend. They'll take down that program uh, and without having an IDE, without having your exact uh, IDE or operating system or whatever, they get the same bundled code, the same functionality, and it runs the same as when you were trying it out. So a program is just bundled code that you can hand out to other people uh, in, a, in a package, in a, in, a, in a little box, and they can use it. So with coding, really, it's about taking ideas and expressing them so that computers can execute what you want them to do, to solve a problem or to um, have some type of functionality. Now, some people will call it logic, this way of expressing yourself um, with a condition and then what happens if that condition is met. And some people see it as communication with um, with computers and it's um, whatever helps you um, some people enjoyed the idea that it's logic and logical and it's based on mathematical way of thinking and solving problems and some people really like and enjoy the idea that it's uh, just talking to a computer just communicating with a computer neither are correct or incorrect it's just a perspective and a way of thinking here really um, but coding is about um, transforming your ideas uh, into ones and zeros that the computer does and you get functionality out of it. And the challenge isn't the rules or the syntax or the amount of keywords or how many programming languages you need to learn. The challenge with coding is learning how to take your ideas and turn them into yes and no uh, conditional statements. So that is an overview of coding, uh, what it looks like, what it is. Um, and I hope you take with you um, that it's more of a mindset and not about remembering vast and vast amount of information. And that there's a lot of functionality hidden and baked in to help you be a better programmer. And it's not about the fact that you need to learn everything 
uh, by heart. It's about you understanding the underlying principles and once you know those, you can look up the rest. So um, thank you so much for watching this and I will hopefully see you in the next video.